Hello, once again I'm with you. My name is Jim Anderson and it's a pleasure to day after day or session after session to share with you the wonderful lessons about rest. For the past few lessons we've focused on how to actually enter into a Sabbath rest. We've made these sessions practical. The first of these practical sessions about entering a rest has been about releasing our concerns. Sabbath or Sabbath rest is a time to release your concerns. I pointed out again and again that the idea of release is part of the Lord's ministry. He releases captives because He cares for them. He released cripples because He cared for them. He releases you today from numerous struggles, anxiety, and whatever else that may burden you. Then we talked about a time to review your life. If again and again you need to release the same thing, perhaps there's something that needs to change with your inner makeup, your configuration. A time to look beneath the surface and observe what are the thoughts, what are the motives, what are the attitudes or emotions that keep bubbling up in my life. Are they all good? Do I need to repent of something? Do I need to change my thought processes? And then we looked at remembering our God, where we look back and see what God has done and how He's worked in our lives. And specifically, the Sabbath was an opportunity to, to look at the creation God has made as in the commandment, the fourth commandment given to us as expressed in the book of Exodus, spoke of the Lord ceased His work, ceased creation to rest. But the emphasis there is what God had made in His creation. And so it's a good idea in remembering God to look at what He has made, to cease our own works long enough to observe what He has done, to put His works occasionally before ours, well before ours. And also the idea of remembering is connected to the deliverance God provided, not merely for the Israelites long ago, their captivity in Egypt, but there's a greater deliverance, our salvation. And we find that the book of Deuteronomy emphasizes that aspect of deliverance. And the greater deliverance is from our sins. And Jesus Christ is our great victor and deliverer. Now we come to yet another point and time. We see there's a time to look forward. A time to look forward to what God has for us. Not just down the road in our earthly existence, but beyond all of that, to take a few moments to look at heaven. So it's a time to look forward. Rest. Sabbath rest. We pause and look into the heavens. I've heard it said a number of times that some people are so heavenly minded they're no earthly good. That is true in many cases where people simply talk or think about spiritual things and they don't fix lunch for one another or they don't make their beds or, I mean, this is an extreme case. Or they don't go to work, they just simply want to talk about godly things in the far off future. But there's another problem in a very busy, restless world. And that is a generation or a people or individuals who simply refuse to look into the heavens and think forward. They're ever trying to make heaven on earth, to better this place, which will never be perfect apart from the ultimate miraculous work of God. They aren't able to work the miracles of perfection in themselves or anyone else. And so we have an obsession today with ever being so earthly minded we're no heavenly good. I'd like you to join me as we think about heaven for a while. God invites us as well to look at the future in terms of the far off miraculous works of God for heaven. We find a very key verse in the New Testament, a verse that looks forward but also looks back by way of illustration. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 reads, 
there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. I want you to keep in your mind for several moments this thought, what is God's rest? Enters God's rest. How might that be inviting or different than the rest that I may conjure up in my own life? Speaking of heaven, rest is a reflection of heaven. That is, we enter into a Sabbath rest to catch just a little glimpse of heaven, to pause and think about heaven and what God has for us in the future. A time when none of us are aging, none of us are crying, none of us are crippled or wounded, none of us are ill. A wonderful time. Heaven is a real place, just as earth is real, realize that heaven is for real. We don't know much about heaven other than it's grand, it's great. This is a real place where there is real rest, especially from sin, sin that makes us restless. Now we look at the book of Hebrews and the book of Hebrews identifies two historical illustrations of heaven. Go back in time. Go back into the Old Testament. Rest in the land. Deuteronomy summarizes the first five books of the Bible as the fifth book. But you will cross the Jordan and settle in the land your God is giving you as an inheritance. And He will give you rest from all your enemies around you so that you will live in safety. So as the children of Israel exited the land of Egypt, miraculously so, going through the Red Sea, which God had divided. They camp out for 40 years because of their disobedience in the wilderness, and they wander there until a whole generation has passed. But God's plan was for them to immediately enter a promised land, a land of rest. It's the next generation, the time of uh, Joshua and Caleb, that finally that next generation gets to enter the land, the promised land. And so this land is free from captivity, which they experienced in the previous generation in Egypt. This land they were then to turn to and find and go to, and God would give them rest, at least a temporary rest from their enemies, enough of a rest for they would then know about the ultimate rest heaven that God would provide for all those who follow and love Him. And we find the book of Hebrews speaks of this illustration, the land. So as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness or the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me for 40 years, saw that I what I did. What that is why I was angry with that generation. And I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You see, they had to go through this and trust God to get through this rugged, rough land, dry and parched as it was, to get to this. And they needed faith. They needed to believe God, that He had the power and the willingness to get them there. But they didn't trust God. Many of them turned away. Many of them became angry with God and Moses, their leader. They became hard of heart. The only way anyone in any time, any generation in all of history can get to God is by faith, believing the words that He gives you. If you doubt and reject those words, you will not enter into heaven. You will not enter into His temporal rest. You will not enter into a Sabbath rest. You have to believe. You have to have faith. It's not hard to have faith if you look at the evidence. 
It's not hard to have faith if you open your heart and your mind. James Montgomery Boyce has put it this way in regard to the promised land. When God led Israel out of Egypt into the wilderness, in their days of wandering, he had a goal to bring them into the promised land. It was be, to be a place where they would find rest from their wanderings. It was a symbol of heaven. And that's the point I'm making. The Old Testament land of Israel was a symbol of heaven. And that's a point that is being made by the writer in the book of Hebrews. And so they would wander about. They would go here and there. But they would eventually get to that land, that promised land. Exiting Egypt, wandering for 40 years because of their disobedience. But God was still faithful to bring another believing generation into the promised land. Hebrews 3 verses 14 through 19 then go on to say, We have come to share in Christ as if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. As has been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard, the rebe heard and rebelled? They, uh, were they not all those Moses led out of, the, out of Egypt? In other words, they saw the miracles at times in Egypt and, and they rebelled. They didn't believe. They had great evidence and reason to believe, but they didn't. And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. And so we are not to miss the message. It's about rest, entering my rest. And I want to unpack and describe that for you in just a moment. What is God's rest? Sins of rebellion. We may rebel against God and what he has said to us. We may neglect it, but do not, do not harden your hearts so that you resist time in and time out again and again until finally your hearts are so hard you reject, you reject the opportunities of rest, eternal and even temporal. Believing from the heart, not just an external show of belief, but believing deep down in your heart, the core of your being. And part of the purpose of rest is to allow God's Word to enter, to penetrate deep inside of you. A sinful, unbelieving heart is a dangerous thing. In fact, it is the most chronic problem in the world today. Urgent. There's a urgency, a today about it. Make haste to do this. Don't put it off. But right now, accept God's means of rest by faith. Secondly, I want you to see another illustration. The book of Hebrews identifies two historic illustrations of heaven. The first is the land. The second is this weekly practice of a Sabbath, resting on the Sabbath day. And the writer of the Hebrews has blended these two illustrations together. Now he shifts in chapter 4 to the seventh day, a day that was set aside from the beginning of creation thereafter as a day of rest, of ceasing. That's what the word means, to cease, to stop making, stop doing. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. It's really a quotation from Genesis chapter 2. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Not everyone enters it, only those who come by way of faith will recognize it, will enter it. And so we read in chapter 4 of Hebrews, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful not that, that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to him or them, because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. 
Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore, God again set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, for so Joshua had given them rest. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. And here is the well-known verse, a capstone to both of these illustrations. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their own, their example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So many times he says, beware, don't be like the dis uh, disbelieving. And that disbelief can have to do a lot to do about eternal life. You disbelieve God's promises for eternal life. I challenge you to turn and look at God in history, his deliverance from Egypt, but his deliverance from sin through his son, Jesus Christ. It doesn't take a great leap of faith. If you look at the Bible and read again and again what is said in chronological order, we find that he has offered eternal life, heaven, through his son, Jesus Christ. And the Old Testament illustrates God's trustworthiness. But also as believers, we may miss a kind of rest and miss the opportunity to think about heaven, miss the enjoyment having, of having a piece of heaven and therefore peace in our lives. What is God's rest about anyway? Entering God's rest, just what is it? God's rest is His finished work. Only in recent days have I pondered this idea of God's rest and how do we enter it, so forth. I want you to note that God's rest is finished work. It's alluded to in the book of Hebrews, looking back at Genesis chapter 2, 1 and 2, which we've looked at again and again. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work He had been doing. He finished the work. So on the seventh day, He rested from all His work. God's rest is His finished work. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. You and I can work and work and work and try to perfect, but it never happens on our own. But God's work is that finished perfect work. Again and again, he said in creation, it is good, it is very good, and he blessed it. So rather than trusting in our own work that is never completed, never perfect on this earth, we enter in our hearts and minds by belief into the finished work of God, creation. Enter his rest, it's perfect. Enter that which he has completed, his work, it's perfect. And the book of Hebrews then speaks not merely of creation, but of salvation. Enter into God's rest, His finished work of salvation. 
That's what the book of Hebrews really focuses on, the fact that the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by the power of Word, His Word. After He had provided perfect, purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, when a priest sits down, the high priest sits down, that means his work of offering sacrifice is over. Earthly high priests never sat down in the Holy of Holies or the Holy Place. They always were working because they never could offer a perfect, complete sacrifice for the people's sin. But Jesus, His sacrifice was perfect and pure. And when He offered that pure, perfect and pure sacrifice, it was done. He said, it is finished. It is over. It's done to completion for the whole world, never to be repeated. Once for all, he died for the sins of the world. And so forth. When, and so then when I enter his rest of salvation, it's a completed work. That means I can put to rest my own efforts to save myself or even to sanctify myself apart from him. And we begin to look like a rested people, a heaven-bound people as we enter into His finished work, and that is entering His rest, true, deep rest. Well, the verses go on in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8. It says, the point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. And likewise, we go to chapter 10. The same thought is repeated about the priest. But when this priest, Jesus Christ, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And yet again, toward the end of the book of Hebrews, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the rest of God in creation is his created work that he completed. And then he rested, unlike our work. But we're invited to enter into his work, his rest, completed work. And likewise, salvation. People are forever working for salvation and they can never complete the job. It is insufficient and unsuccessful. But when you enter into God's rest of salvation through Jesus Christ, who sat down completing the work, completing our work of salvation, then we enter that rest which is eternal. You see, when we practice that kind of entering into His rest on a weekly basis, Sabbath or every day or whatever we do, we stop and we rest deeply deeply knowing that we are resting in the completed work of Jesus Christ, the High Priest. God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. The Sabbath is therefore a window to the future. It points to a time when God will make sense of this mess. It tells us that there is more than just the inexorable march of time. It reminds us that there is meaning to our lives beyond the rat race. What part of us needs to find rest? Obviously our bodies, because we work physically. Even if we have a desk job, our bodies get tired. Our minds get weary day in and day out. Our soul Hard to explain and understand, but there's a weariness that takes place there too. And obviously our spirit, our human spirits, get down and weary. We need rest. Rest is very healing, as I've said before. And faith, perhaps our faith gets stale and needs refreshment. An old hymn, simply by title, teaches us much. My faith has found a resting place. A resting place in the finished work of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a common practice among Christians to partake of the Lord's Supper together with the people of God, but it too reflects heaven. 
After taking the cup, Jesus said, in giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. A reminder of the eternal, a time we will, we will meet with him. So, I call you to enter into God's rest. And that is a rest which acknowledges God's work has completed for me my salvation. I don't add to it. I dare not subtract to it from it. So, enter his rest by receiving Jesus Christ as Savior, if you haven't done that already. And you who have, pause, stop striving as if you are unsaved. But rest, and you will rise to do the works that God has called you to do. There's a rest for the people of God. I hope you find it. I hope you enjoy it. Session over. <laughs>